Steve here again, and I am giving you a short little announcement that, as you well know, the history of the papacy and beyond the big screen are members of the Parthenon Podcast Network, and today I'm welcoming the latest member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, Josh Cohen, who is the host of the Eyewitness History Podcast. In this podcast, now you'll probably be familiar with Josh, being that he is a multiple-time guest on Beyond the Big Screen. Josh is the host of the Eyewitness History Podcast. He is also the managing editor of the history website, History on the Net. And Josh's whole thing is he loves hearing great stories. He started a podcast earlier called Unfiltered with Josh Cohen, which has been going on for five years. And he got the idea for starting this Eyewitness History podcast. What you'll hear from Josh in Eyewitness History is real stories from history, from the people who experienced this history. And there could, there'll be interviews with people who experienced historical events. There'll be uh, testimonials from people who actually experienced certain events in history. And today you're going to get a short little snippet of what Josh is doing, particularly from two people. One is Bill Taylor, who is the an author and Vietnam War veteran, he shares his experience about his new book on full automatic surviving 13 months in Vietnam. He shared what he felt when he first landed in Vietnam, and he shares why the Marines almost didn't allow him to leave Vietnam. So that's really interesting. And then we'll get another taste from Hope Harrison, who uh, is a professor of history, and Hope was on a flight to Berlin when she got word that the wall fell. And she'll explain a little bit more about some of the details she experienced with the fall of the wall. You can also participate if you experienced or were a part of a, of a historical event. You can contact Josh. All you have to do is go to his website, eyewitnesshistorypodcast.com, and click on the speak pipe button, and that'll tell you everything you need to know, the details. But you can leave a message in there, and then Josh will get in contact with you. And it's a, just a great way to share your own personal story. Now, also, to launch the show, we as a network are doing a little bit of a giveaway where the first five people to leave a review on Apple Podcasts page for the podcast will get a $50 Amazon gift card. For instructions on how to enter and all that good stuff, go over to eyewitnesshistorypodcast.com. You have until midnight on Friday, April 15th to enter. You've got a lot of things to do if you're in the U.S. on April 15th, but make sure you get it done before that, just like you do with your taxes. It is a pleasure to announce Josh's podcast. I am already hooked in a fan, and I know you'll enjoy too, so enjoy this little taste of Eyewitness History, and I'll talk to you next time. What was it like to hear about the JFK assassination or America's triumph over Hitler or seeing Queen at Live Aid? Our past is a collection of stories that bring us to now. Welcome to the Eyewitness History Podcast, where we view history through the eyes of the people that watch the events that shaped our world. Here's your host, Josh Cohen, and these are their stories. As you might imagine, Bill, with uh, with a podcast like Eyewitness History, one of my goals, as it were, is to basically put the listeners there. And I'd like to know, what was your mindset like when you were first boots down in Vietnam? What were you feeling? Can you recall? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, first of all, my first boots down was in Okinawa. I met my battalion, 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines there. They had brought this battalion of Marines from Quezon to Okinawa to be trained as a special landing force helicopter assault group. Well, not only were we training for helicopter assault, we also mic boats and Amtraks, you know, getting on and off ships. So they trained us for at least six to eight weeks of hard, intense training. And that's where I first had my experience of Vietnam. But I remember being on the USS Okinawa going towards the shore and I remember walking through the center of the Okinawa, you know, waiting in line to get on the helicopters and, you know, the adrenaline's flowing, you know, you're going in, you've been trained, you know what you're going to do. You had the old salts who who knew what they were doing and you had this whole new group of new people joining it to bring this 
Battalion of Marines. That's uh, 1,350 Marines. Wow. You know, and one big, large group and four companies of basic infantry and one company of uh, weapons. And so they divided the weapons up into the different companies, and then they divided it up into the different platoons. And, we're, you know, we're on the helicopters. I mean, you have no idea what it feels like, the adrenaline. It's almost like a, a carnival ride. Mm. You know, for the first time, you're getting up, and you're, you're starting to, you know, go in, in the helicopter, and it's shaking like it's going to tear apart. And then all of a sudden, it smooths out. And cold air rushes in. You got fumes going into your face. And then as you're lifting off the helicopter in a group, as your group lifting up, all of a sudden you look off and you see the USS Sanctuary or the USS Repose sitting off into the distance. You know, you, so you feel like, oh, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, good because it's there, bad because obviously there's going to be a problem. Otherwise, it wouldn't be following us around. Right. And then, of course, coming in and, and you, they, they go, we, the hot choppers go really high into the air. And as, as we were starting to land, I remember in Okinawa, we trained, it was about 80 degrees, 85 degrees, the hottest. When we hit that ground uh, early that morning, uh, it was so hot and it was early in the morning. And, you know, we jumped off the helicopters and we, we went up and set up a perimeter. And of course, just like you see, and we were soldiers, you know, they hmm. just take off and uh, in kind of a tandem one after the other. And now you're standing there by yourself. The word came down. Uh, they didn't take us far enough into where they were supposed to. So we had to walk an extra like five miles just to get to the spot we were supposed to be at. Wow. And it was so hot. Guys were drinking water. I mean, you know, the thirst. And you're carrying 50, 60 pounds of sure. gear. I mean, you got this helmet on. You got your flak jacket. And I remember, I mean, first hands on the ground, it was really, uh, you felt strong and powerful and everything else. But mm. once you got to a point, well, first of all, that first day, this guy started passing out. I mean, heat exhaustion. We just couldn't, we just couldn't move. It, it got to be so bad that it's, they took some of the, brought some of the helicopters back just to take guys up in the air and bring them back down to cool them off. That's how bad it was. Wow. And uh, we were in this valley, uh, and there's supposed to be at least another full regiment. That means 3,500 North Vietnamese coming into this area, and they're supposed to, like, get their food. This area was Viet, Viet, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong friendly. They hmm. didn't like Americans. I mean, they weren't for us. So whenever you ran across anybody, they were just like, get the heck out of our way. And, you know, our battalion was sweeping up the valley, all the companies sweeping up the valley and like a straight across. And there was three other battalions that were already in the hills sweeping around. So what we're trying to do is get this 3,500 NVA pretty much trying to trap them up there. Right. And uh, so I remember the first time we're going in the valley and then they, they started shooting, like we got into this area where it was like, it wasn't jungle, but it was very heavy brush. And all of a sudden, the AK-47 started coming at us. And I got to tell you, we practiced for this. We practiced. But there's nothing like someone trying to kill you. It, it's a whole different feeling altogether. I mean, the adrenaline's flowing and you're getting down and you just, you, you're like, you know what you're trained to do, but you're terrified at the same time, at the very same second. So, you know, I, you know, you're hiding behind a log and I'm just spraying fire out there to, I can't see what it is, but if right. We're going to try to scare the hell out of them, you know, shoot as many rounds as you can. So all that was, we didn't know it at the time, but that was just a delaying tactic that they used. They would slow us up so they could set up to see where we were going and pass the word so they could set up ambushes and things wow. like that. So, of course, you go a little further and, you know, all of a sudden you're in the open and there's a little hill in front of us. And we're starting to climb this first hill and I heard the bloop, 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 bloop bloop sound it's just exactly bloop bloop you're hearing it and being a new guy i don't know what the heck is that sound you know they're blooping and all of the old salts are saying hit the dirt you know hit the deck and you know, it's like they're down and we're all standing there going what for you know and, and all of a sudden you hear them go over your head and it's like oh wow i mean now i that's the first 
learning, hearing the bloop. And so from then on, if you heard that sound, you got right down just like the old salts did. So, you know, it, it's a learning process that happened to me in Vietnam. Just every little thing we did was just learning. And this whole battalion was learning. Uh, also, all of the all of the sergeants and we had great leadership, great sergeants, great squad leaders, great platoon sergeant. He was phenomenal. And we had this gung ho lieutenant who was, you know, absurd. Uh, at least we thought he was absurd because, you know, he just all he wanted to do was, you know, charge. And we know, you know, from just watching TV, that doesn't always work. You know, you got to think first. So it was difficult. It was difficult for us all. And and then, of course, as the as the day lingered on, I mean, more guys, heat, heat stroke. I mean, I, I think we lost a good 80 guys from heat stroke. We wow. lost them for a day and they had to bring them back out later, you know, that just the, their eyes rolling in the back of their heads and stuff like that. I mean, mm -hmm. but no more water. You know, after the first day, people were drinking all their water and I was just trying to baby my water. And I was a big legs, big, strong guy. And so I was able to kind of hump where, you know, I was on the football team. I was on the basketball team. I was in all these sports. And I think that helped me, you know, push through all that stuff where, you know, if you didn't have that, you, you just kind of drank your water and didn't care. Well, that also taught us how to really start sharing, you know, not drinking as much water and guzzling water or trying to lose water like you're going to pour it on yourself. I mean, it becomes a very valuable commodity. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's the first experience of like my first day. So on November 9th, 1989, when the wall fell by surprise, I happened to be on a plane headed from the U.S. to West Berlin, knowing nothing of what was happening on the ground. Talk about an amazing stroke of luck. So I was with a group of graduate students from Harvard and Stanford, brought to West Berlin every year. They brought a group of students and we left. Kennedy Airport in New York City, the evening of November 9th, and touched down the next morning in Frankfurt. You couldn't fly directly into West Berlin. You had to fly to West Germany and then take either Pan Am, uh, Air France, or British Airways from West Germany to West Berlin. So when we got on the commuter flight from Frankfurt to West Berlin, I saw everyone reading newspapers with these huge banner headlines saying, Die Mauer is open, which means the wall is open. And I'm thinking, what? Like, what is going on? I'm thinking, is my German not as good as I think it is? Or maybe is November 10th the equivalent of April Fool's Day in Germany? What the heck? So I'm sitting there really wondering when the pilot gets on the intercom and he says, ladies and gentlemen, in case you haven't heard, the Berlin Wall fell last night and we are flying into history. <laughs> wow. I could not believe it. I was a graduate student writing my dissertation on the Berlin Wall and now suddenly it seemed to be coming down. It was just amazing. So we arrived in West Berlin. I was there for 10 days. I shared the incredible moments of jubilation with so many Berliners watching bulldozers come and remove pieces of the wall to create new entry and exit points between East Berlin and West Berlin. I stood in this line of this, you know, people form two lines on either side of the new crossing point to greet the East Berliners who were coming through either on foot or in their cars. I mean, you know, I watched these people from the West hugging these people from the East. I watched them give them flowers, give them West German money, the Deutschmark, watch them give them champagne. I mean, People were crying. People were hugging. It was, it was just incredible. And in fact, 
the the word most associated with those hours after the Berlin Wall opened was Wahnsinn, which means crazy. You know, all these people were standing there saying, you know, it's Wahnsinn. This is Wahnsinn. This is crazy. This thing that people thought could never happen had happened and happened peacefully that weekend in West Berlin. So the wall fell what was Thursday night to Friday night, November 9th to 10th. So now it's Friday the 10th, and then you've got the weekend. Two million East Germans visited the city of West Berlin that weekend. Now, there were only two and a half million people living in West Berlin. So the population almost doubled over the weekend with all these visitors. The main street in West Berlin, sort of the equivalent of Fifth Avenue in New York, is called the Kurfürstendamm or the Kudam. Well, they had to close the Kudam to traffic because there were just mobs and mobs of East Germans strolling the main street, looking at the storefronts, looking at all the goods that they didn't have in East Berlin, going to movie theaters, going to the most famous department store, which is six stories. It's called Kade Bay sort of like Harrods in London, this most amazing store. The top floor was the food floor. And they have like hundreds of different kinds of sausages. And of course, Germans love sausages, what we would call hot dogs. You know, that floor with the food was packed with East Germans. Others were going to visit family or friends that they hadn't seen, you know, sometimes in decades. So it was such an amazing, joyous experience that I will never forget. Thanks for listening to this episode. For more information on eyewitness history, along with show notes and links to resources, go to parthenonpodcast.com, where you can also listen to some other great podcasts by the Parthenon Network, such as Scott Rank's History Unplugged, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen, and James Early's Key Battles of American History, along with many others. Thank you. Thank you.